Okay, it's going. Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, we had the birth of a baby, a Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Then we read about the Magi, an epiphany, when the Christ child is revealed as the Savior, as the Messiah. Now today we read about the baptism of Jesus. There is very little that is written between his birth, the revelation about his birth, and his baptizing. baptism. There is that little event in the temple when he's 12, but he's 30 or so now, an old man by many standards of that day. But then again, many in the Bible seem to live hundreds of years. Noah, I believe, was in his 900s when he built the ark. Today, we read in the Acts passage that Paul asked some disciples, who I always find interesting that it was 12 of them, if they received the Holy Spirit when they became believers. Remember, in the time of Jesus, there were believers who we came to call Christians, and there were the Jews. So when we are asked about when they became believers, I interpret that to mean when they became Christians. In Acts, Paul lays his hands on them, and they are baptized in the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is upon them. They did not receive the Holy Spirit from John. In the Mark passage, Jesus is baptized by John, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove onto him. In both of these passages and in the other gospels that tell us about Jesus' baptism and the baptism by John, we are told that one more powerful than John is coming after John and will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that is Jesus. That's a common theme in the gospels. There are many thoughts and ideas about baptism. And there's a wide range of thought indeed if you spend any time looking it up on the web or in a book. In the Christian, <clears throat> the Catholic tradition, hang on. In the Catholic tradition, babies are baptized to remove original sin, the sin that we all inherit just by being born from Adam and Eve. In the Disciples of Christ tradition, young adults, usually after a confirmation class, make a choice. Their choice is to be baptized or to be blessed. In the UCC, we baptize infants, we baptize adults, or we baptize youth who have chosen to become baptized. Listen to this definition of baptism. Baptism is the outward act that symbolizes the inward phenomenon of coming to and accepting Jesus Christ as real, as God incarnate, as a sacrificial means by which those who believe in him can be forever reconciled to God. The purpose of baptism is to give visual testimony of our commitment to Christ. It's the first step of discipleship, and that comes from Acts 8. Baptism is in part about honoring this life that we have. Quite often, as it is in the case of the Disciples of Christ denomination, it is a choice versus, it is our choice versus God's choice. In traditions that have infant baptism, it's the parent's choice. Quite often it's the grandparent's choice. When I say that baptism is about honoring this life, I guess that what I'm thinking about is the view that the disciples of Christ and the UCC think about baptism. Baptism is not a requirement for entry into heaven. It might not hurt, but it's not a requirement. The other day I was discussing this with a colleague. Both of us had been chaplains in hospital settings. And we talked about baptism. We talked about this week's lectionary. And one aspect that many people don't think about is the baptism of an infant that is stillborn. 
or die shortly after birth. Many religions will not baptize a dead baby. When I worked at a Catholic hospital, they did not have us baptize the dead. They would have us try to convince the parents to honor the life of the baby by having a naming ceremony. There were, however, there were a few of us that would honor the parents by baptizing their stillborn baby. I combined the honoring of the child and the parents' grief and loss by a naming ceremony, often combined with a baptism. And lucky for me, none of the nurses or doctors turned me in for doing that. Seems that's the way many of us in the UCC feel. I cannot imagine not honoring a parent's wishes. I will tell you, I cried more with those parents, regardless of whether I was doing a naming or a baptism. I realize many of you will never experience that. But let me tell you, it is always so emotional to deal with the death of a child. And for me, it's gut-wrenching when it's a baby. Epiphany precedes the baptism of Jesus in our biblical narratives. It's the insight before the act. As I said at the beginning of the service, when I read your description of Epiphany, it's a Christian feast day that celebrates the, re re the revelation of God incarnate as Jesus Christ. Then we have John baptizing converts. But saying that one greater is coming, the Holy Spirit comes not only to, but upon Jesus when he is baptized. We know that John's been baptizing, but as we hear in Acts, those disciples did not know about the Holy Spirit. But John did. And when John baptizes Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes down upon him, along with words from God. You are my son. You are the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. <clears throat> if we spend a little time with this text or other gospel accounts of this baptism incident, we might get an insight that unsettles our uncomfortable, our comfortable assumptions and stirs our imaginations a bit. For example, if we look closely, the sky doesn't just open up, it's torn apart. Can you imagine what a torn apart sky would look and feel like and how you would respond to it? It is not insignificant in the gospel that uses the same violent verb only once more. And that is to describe the temple curtain being torn apart when Jesus died. Douglas, Mayer, Douglas R. A. Hare writes, Mark may have selected this violent verb in order to point to God's invasion of a sinful world. The water, the mud, the torn open sky, they all go well with this rugged prophet John, whose dress and preaching style would hardly fit in most respectable pulpits today. This is an earthy story. Here, Elton Brown writes, is a reminder that the gospel is down to earth, grounded in the real, tactile, sensual, fleshy world. In these few verses are references to river water, clothing from a camel, a diet of bugs, tying shoes. There's a bird analogy with the dove and an interesting weather phenomena. Mark's earthiness gives us a hedge against faith and worship that are too ethereal, otherworldly, and abstract. What do you think would happen if someone dressed and possibly smelling like John came into our church on Sunday morning and took a seat up front? And then what if he walked up to the pulpit and started preaching repentance? If that's like something you would like, let me know. I'll see who I can invite. But otherwise, how would you make that feel? What does baptism mean? Since we are a church and a denomination with only two sacraments, baptism and communion, it's an important question as we stand here at the font 
at the baptismal font. Marcus Borg provides historical context. Ritual immersion in water, both in Judaism and other cultures, can have two meanings. When repeated frequently, it has the meaning of washing or purification. When it is a once only ritual, as it apparently was for John, it may also be purification, but its primary meaning is an init initiation ritual which symbolizes and confers a new identity. While we don't receive other names during our baptism, in the Catholic faith you, faith, you do choose a name when you are confirmed. You get a new identity in your life with Christ. Christianity is not precise. It is messy. And these two accounts show us some of that. God comes to us where we are, when we are ready. You don't just get the Holy Spirit at baptism. The Holy Spirit comes to us when it is the right time. Not always on our time though. It's a bit like prayer, as I say. God answers our prayers, but not always in the way that we expect when we pray. Same is true of baptism. Not everyone gets the Holy Spirit that they are aware of. Theologians, <coughs> excuse me, theologians are still not 100% in agreement. Do we all get the Holy Spirit at baptism? I would say yes, but it may not be immediately apparent to us. And then again, it may never be apparent to us. It's a bit of a mystery to me and to others, especially when others see the Holy Spirit in us when we don't see it ourselves. Of the many things written about this text, Frank Yamada's words may pull all, the to all this together the best. The remembering, the renewal, the power and the risk and the belovedness, reminding us that the spirit moves in and out of our busy lives. And there are times when I recognize the spirit's hovering presence, beckoning all to a different order, to a new creation. As I reach for the water, whether in a font or on the ocean's edge, I find myself trying to connect to the chaotic, life-giving and mysterious power that resides in its depths. Fittingly, Riamata turns to a poet to express, to express his deep longing. One day, I hope that I can say, alongside with Langston Hughes, I've known rivers, ancient, dusty rivers. My soul has grown deep like the waters. That was in a story in the Christian century. I have two very peaceful places and times in my life. One is fog. I find fog to be very, very relaxing and mysterious and warms me immensely if I'm not driving in it. Fog that envelops, it distorts our vision. It leaves us with a mystery to be seen as it swirls and thickens and thins. The other is when I'm sitting at the edge of the ocean or the edge of the river or by a stream water. Interesting, fog is water vapor. So the ocean, the lakes, the streams, they are water in the most physical sense. Maybe water being my peaceful place is taking me back to my back to, back to, back to my baptism, to my Holy Spirit moments in my life. Even with a torn open sky, the words that resound are beloved and listen, hardly words of judgment or words that should inspire fear. How do you experience God's loving faithfulness and care in your own life and in the life of the congregation and our denomination today? How often do you even think about baptism or specifically your baptism? When do you and can you imagine yourself as beloved? 
Can you imagine that each person, child or adult, in our church, in our town, in our country, in our world, can you imagine each person as a beloved child of God? Would pausing to remember that affect how each person is treated? In a world full of violence and hatred, where is our circle of mercy and safety and love? There is perhaps no more meaningful experience in the life of a pastor than the act of baptism. That time when we pour living waters over the one to be baptized, placing a hand on their head and pronouncing the words, the Holy Spirit be upon you, child of God, disciple of Christ, member of this church. The congregation in turn joins in this affirmation, seeing the newly baptized through the eyes of God, in a way, affirming them as beloved, acknowledging them as called by name and precious in God's sight. This beautiful bond shapes us as a community. One United Church of Christ pastor introduces a newly baptized person to his congregation by saying, in this family, water is thicker than blood. God has formed us in love and found us good. And yet we see ourselves in one another as flawed and deficient. What would happen if we saw ourselves as created for God's glory, as Isaiah 43, 7 tells us? Could we then ever stand our, understand ourselves and others as anything but beloved by God? Think about it. Amen. You can stop the recording.